Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual Cambridge Union. I'm really excited to mark the beginning of this term's art series with Rupert Gould. I'm just going to give a rough outline of today's event. Um, so Rupert will give a short talk, then we'll have a moderated Q&A session, and then we'll hopefully have some time for audience questions. Um, there should be a Google form um, which you can submit questions through, um, which has been publicised on our Facebook page, so do please get involved. Um, and now a final word of introduction from me, which can't possibly do justice, Rupert, but I'm going to just do this anyway, this is standard. So Rupert Gould is the Artistic Director of the Almeida Theatre in London. He was also Artistic Director of Headlong Theatre and Associate Director at the Royal Shakespeare Company. During that time, um, he also directed a range of plays, musicals, operas, films, TV programmes, you name it, and notable adaptations include American Psycho, Richard II and The Merchant of Venice. In 2019, he released his second feature film, Judy, um, and he has numerous accolades under his belt, having twice been the recipient of the Olivia Critics Circle and Evening Standard Awards for Best Director. In 2017, um, he received a CBE for his services to drama in the New Year Honours. So I'm really honoured to welcome Rupert to our Zoom Stage. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for being like, like having me here. I, I was um, I actually never went into the union when I was at Cambridge, so uh, I was kind of looking forward to being there in person finally. And uh, you know, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame not to be, but um, but you know, it's um, you know, I feel really for you guys so much at the moment because. I can't imagine being, I mean, it's obviously a terrible time for the whole world, but like what a time to be a student. And um, I'm sure that's, that's been really, really tough and punishing on you. And, um, you know, what I'd say, it, particularly to those people who are really passionate about performing arts, is that, you know, that this must be a real wound. You know, you come to university to share those, those passions and those skills with people and, um, uh, you know, not to be able to do that must be awful. And, and, and uh, the, I hope the pledge I can make personally, but also to, from the sector is that I, I do think people in the industry are really aware of, of your generation as a cohort too and, and what they've been through. And uh, I hope that we'll be able to offer advice and support for everyone who, who kind of, for anything they felt, felt, felt they met, missed in their time as a, as a student. Um, I mean, if any consolation, I didn't direct anything until my third year. So <laughs> you've got plenty of time. Um, so I thought, um, I thought I'd talk a bit about acting, if that was okay, um, today. Um, and acting is something I've been thinking a lot about over the last year, I guess, um, through lockdown. Um, and uh, I, guess, I guess the reason that might be a bit odd for me, I think, is that a lot of the... The way I kind of made my name, I suppose, as a director, it took me quite a while to get going that way, um, was sort of kind of with more conceptual work, I guess, work that kind of sought to break open um, extant texts. And sometimes I think that was really exciting. And I think I probably did some things that were in illuminating and informative, but um, at other times it was probably pretentious and flashy and self-regarding uh, skills I'm sure I learned at Cambridge. But, um, but you know, that was, I, I suppose in, in my early thirties, I look back and think, um, maybe people might not have thought of me as an actor's director as opposed to some you know, conceptualist at some level. And um, that was brought home to me when I heard an anecdote recently from a, an, an assistant I'd had, who before she'd come to assist at, as at the Almeida, had um, met a mentor figure for her who'd been another director called Ian Rickson, who's a friend of mine and a wonderful director and, a, and a very much an actor's director. And this assistant had said to him before she joined me, um, you know, what's Rupert Gould like as a director? And I think she'd been at his house and he was cooking at the time. And he, uh, he apparently thought, he thought about it for a bit and he picked up a pepper that he was uh, cooking with. And he paused and he said, um, for me as a director, when I look at this pepper, I think, what can I do to bring out the most essential pepperiness in the pepper? Um, do I drizzle it with some olive oil and grill it? Do I bake it? Do I chop it up and serve it in salads? Do I um, put it out? Um, my job is to find the essence, the, the purest pepperiness of this pepper. And he said, but I think for Rupert Gould, um, he looks at that pepper and says, oh, this could be a hat or a car or a dog. <laughs> Um, and that's, that sort of stung a bit, but I kind of recognised the truth in it at some level. And um, 
but I, but, I, but I suppose what I've been reflecting on is I, I do think that actually anyone who wants to be a, a director of, of drama has to really want to spend a lot of time with performers. They have to want to, they have to adore what it is to make a performance with an actor. And, and that was very much when I was at Cambridge, I think that was, you know, my way in. I kind of, maybe I thought about being an actor a bit, but, you know, I did a bit like everybody probably does. But then I quickly found as soon as I, you know, was on the other side of the, um, uh, of the stage, as it were, that I, I immediately felt at home. And that wasn't really to do with the lights and the power and the sort of glamour. It, it was because I loved watching the actors and kind of noting them. And, you know, I guess why I've been reflecting on that in this, in this last year is literally like a week or so, or a few weeks before lockdown hit incredibly suddenly. And I remember being in the Almeida office and we were closed three days later, really, after getting the news. And it was, it was to, 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 to shut down a whole theatre and a whole operation you know, plays literally about to go into performance, plays in rehearsals, box office staff, audience, thousands of tickets, you know, in three days um, uh, is, is a big ask. Uh, but literally like three weeks before, I think I had been at the Oscars. Um, and I certainly, I look back and think if I was able to tell my student self that I would one day get to the Oscars, I would, uh, I would pat myself quietly on the back, I think. Um, and I was there with this film, Judy, that I'd, I'd made last year, and at which Renée Zellweger won the um, Best Actress Oscar for, for her performance. And not only had she won the Oscar, she actually won pretty much every award there was to win through the award season. And it was really uh, just an extraordinary journey to kind of go on to be working on a, on a piece that had been very much based around the performance, the whole, play, the whole film was constructed around the performance. And to think, oh, well, maybe, maybe I can be an actor's director. Maybe, maybe I can see Pepper um, in the Pepper, as it were. Um, and I, but I suppose this year I've been reflecting a little bit on whether the things that made, if I have any ability to direct actors, made me think about that performance with Renee, whether that had begun at Cambridge, I guess, whether, whether Cambridge had taught me anything that was part and parcel of my craft now. And, um, when I was, so I was at Trinity in the early 90s and the, the English faculty at Trinity at that time was, because uh, I, I studied English, um, was very austere and um, ex exceptionally intimidating and um, very Catholic in both senses of the word, probably in respect a bit right wing. Um, but very like Trinity as a college probably. Um, and um, I, I was really sort of starstruck by these, the th particularly three or four um, dons we had at the time, who, who were an amazing group of people as teachers. Um, and their methodology, I guess, was then called new historicism. I don't know whether that's even a term that people use anymore, but uh, it was very fashionable in the late 80s, early 90s. And um, I guess it, it's, 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 what it posited was the idea that uh, an artwork or a text could only be truly read or understood through, yes, very close reading in the, in the Cambridge tradition, but also um, a sort of deep dive into ancillary texts around the cultural moment that the work was made. And it had a real focus on reading things like, I don't know, wills or grain harvest manuals or uh, you know, these obscure chapbooks or whatever. And, and so you came to understand The Tempest or whatever better through knowing about the, in some ways, the more obscure, the, 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 the ancillary reading, the better. It always felt actually in retrospect a little bit like it was setting a deliberately impossible task for you because there was never, you could never read enough. There was always some corner of the library that you know, was hidden to you. And if you'd only unlock that, then you might get a first order. Um, so it had that kind of heavy, punishing, intimidating feel that I, I remember from academia at Cambridge. Um, but sure enough, when I think about how I was going to begin with Renee, and you know, you meet a movie star, you don't really know them. It's 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 a funny gig that you know. How are you going to establish a language? You know, the default is to show the hard work you've been doing. And um, I guess with Judy Garner, and I did an enormous amount of reading around her. And of course, there is a huge amount to read. There's all the audio recordings, the film, all the all the, the films, the. Um, you know, she married six people, practically all of them wrote a book about her. There's like a, there's a huge amount to read about Judy Garland. And so we did all that work and I would submit great pages to Renee. Of, oh, I found this little thing about this, or this is how she behaved. Um, and so in some sense, that kind of research-based, uh, almost academic uh, archaeology was kind of, yes, a starting point at least. Uh, but then I also thought a little bit like when I was at Trinity, I was aware of these sort of trendier, postmodern kind of uh, call, you know, groups and 
Jesus and Kings and these cool places that I wasn't at. <laughs> and I, um, you know, and I would, but I was always very curious and occasionally I would write essays sort of in a more, in, in a form more inspired by critical theory and I'd get my wrist slapped by the Trinity Dons. Um, not quite literally, but practically literally. Um, and, um, but I was, I was sort of aware with Garland that, you know, she, of course, Judy Garland is a huge um, set of signifiers and meanings for in particular the LGBTQ community. And, you know, as a, as a straight man, I felt like I really wanted to try and comprehend that, that narrative, I guess, as all, all that sort of almost um, real aesthetic of performance in some ways that, that one associates with Garland. And so I kind of thinking about that, got a couple of, um, got in touch with a couple of drag acts. One was a kind of performance artist who has a, an act that draws on Judy Garland that we'd work with at the Almeida, and the other was much more sort of conventional RuPaul style kind of drag act. But we, they both came in, they worked a bit with Renee and I and talked both about what, you know, about sort of physicalities and sort of performative things, but also about what Garland means, both to the Stonewall era of the of gay rights movement, but also to them now, for better or worse. And, and so that was kind of interesting and another layer that we added on. And then I suppose I was beginning to move into the more technical work that I guess I've learned since Cambridge. Um, you know, the, the singing was a huge part of it. We did like probably nine months development of, the, of, of vocal work with Renee, and there's a lot of technical work about voice placement, about dropping your voice, and then there's dialect, um, and then there's physicality, and I guess Michael Chekhov exercises that I sort of vaguely had studied a bit at Cambridge and then done a bit at the RSC, um, and in particular some exercises that I, I was lucky enough to work with a company called the Wooster Group, or a kind of avant-garde New York theatre group, um, who do this really extraordinary work, and we've been working, when I was at the RSC with the Wooster Group, on a production of uh, Troilus and Cressida, we were doing some research and, you know, we, at the RSC, we had done our verse work and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but in the Wooster of Garage, you know, they were doing shot for shot recreations of Brad Pitt's Troy, uh, using in-ear pieces, drawing on the, um, the dialect in, in those films while reading the text of Troilus and Cressida. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this is a hike, a whole another world to me. But I learned a lot about how, anti-psychological approaches to acting through pure mimicry can be kind of liberating and, and so we did some of that stuff with Renee as well using in-ear monitors um, uh, so that was interesting and then and then of course we were doing the work that you do around making a movie which is to do with hair and makeup and you know, all the testing you do and prosthetics and you're sort of trying to literally remodel someone's face you know contact lenses false teeth you know it, it's very surface but it's, it's remodeling somebody's whole face from one thing to another. Um, and, you know, so you have all these different techniques and like I say, some of them began for me for Cambridge, but then many subsequent. Um, and the effect is to create like a kind of scaffolding around the, the artwork, in this case, the performance. And then there's a kind of key moment, a kind of unveiling, which happens, you know, I think normally about in a film, probably about three, four weeks before you start filming and play, it's a bit different. When the scaffold kind of falls away and you see the thing you've made, all the layers of lacquer that you've been putting on and on and on. Um, and it's a kind of really compelling moment. And um, I suppose maybe an, another metaphor I might use for it would be, um, if, if one was to, to, to turn a, to change a chair into a table, and you think, well, how will I go about that? Well, I, I'm, I guess I'm going to take the arms off. Uh, I'll probably take the back off. I'm going to raise the legs up. Um, and, you know, hey, presto, there's a kind of little table. Um, but, but I guess the thing about the artistic creative process is you're not really interested in a chair and you're not really interested in the table. What you're interested in is knowing that the table you have now was a chair. It's, it's seeing the chair in the table is, what is, is the thing you're after. And... Why is that? And, and, and particularly, I think this is what we hit the sweet spot with, with Judy, I suppose, was because, you know, that, that cast me back a bit to Renee herself and who she was. And of course, I approached Garland very objectively, a, you know, uh, an otherness that I was going to research and build and construct with this actor. But I remember that when I met Renee, I was struck by... Um, all sorts of things about her. I mean, of course, you meet anybody, you read them in lots of different ways, but if you meet a, a movie star, then it's like that. It's, it's a humming with, 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 with meanings, as it were. And I was struck by 
you know, as you always are with movie stars, they all seem smaller than, <laughs> than in, on the screen. But also she was uh, kind of quiet, but very intelli intelligent and deeply political. It was a kind of peak Trump period and she was railing about that. And, um, very different to kind of the woman maybe I expected to meet. And I, 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 the more I kind of talked to her and worked with her, the more I realized that she had come through in the 90s, sort of Bridget Jones era, when this certain idea of the female movie star was kind of being developed, um, which at the time ridiculously felt sort of independent movie and, and even slightly feminist, which was a sort of, um, and most of these women were blonde and kind of kooky and you know it was uh jennifer aniston and reese witherspoon and um you know renee was very much part of that and um you know i i, I looked at her and thought you know effectively this whole persona you've built up is based on a sort of uh, i mean move this cautiously like a sort of reduction of herself almost in a way an infantilism i guess of her, um and I think Renee had hit a point where in her career where she'd gone, I don't want to do this anymore. It's just too exhausting, the pressure of being a star, the pressure of being uh, particularly a female star. And I think, you know, I haven't seen this Britney Spears um, documentary, but I think that obviously speaks to, you know, what it was like in that period. Um, and, you know, so she'd been through a lot and then she'd stopped. She'd stopped for six or seven years completely. You know, arguably, you know, people speculated that you know, she was kind of exhausted or broken in a Judy Garland-like way, but it wasn't. I think she just literally said, I've had enough. And then she started coming back and she got all this crap online about like, oh, she's changed, she looks different, blah, blah, blah. And um, really punishing cruel stuff. I guess she'd left pre-social media and come back post-social media and that was an interesting journey. And um, anyway, this is all kind of roundabout way of saying that actually... Of course, the more I worked with her, the more I found her the interesting thing. And it wasn't about her losing herself in Judy Garland. It was about Judy Garland some, somehow being lost in her. And uh, that's the chair and the table, as I was saying. And the, the, so, so the pursuit of the pepper, to go back to Ian's metaphor, you know, yes, the pepper might be a hat, but that doesn't mean you're not, you're not pursuing something that is in its own way authentic. And I, and I suppose what that's kind of made me reflect on is again on my time at Cambridge but also maybe our um, wider academic culture in this country and internationally I guess which is that it is so focused on that which can be critical and analytical and um, and studied at some level and yet I feel that certainly for artists the interior journey about who you are um, is the is the really crucial one and um, you know, I think when you're at Cambridge, certainly my memory of it anyway, was the sort of, the pepper was your studies, you know. Whereas in fact, the pepper is and should always be yourself. And the studies are a means to understand yourself better. Uh, and I think that applies really massively to, to artists. But I also think it applies to people in whatever walk of life you go into. You know, somebody walks out on stage, like I was saying about Renee, they, they, they bleed meanings every second. And, you know, the more you can understand the meanings that you are presenting as a performer, and we are all performers in, in our own lives, the, the deeper understanding you'll have of yourself uh, and the truer understanding you'll have of yourself. And, and I think it's a shame that, I mean, it's the great argument for art. It's reception, yes, but, but even more, it's creation and the participation in the work of creating art because it is the truest and surest way to come to self-understanding. But it's not the only, art isn't the only thing, of course. And, and I, I find it strange that our academic culture doesn't really look to the subjective in the interior and and I guess it, for me whenever I've been making a play or a film I think there's an Emily Dickinson metaphor about death being like life is that you look through the window and you see the garden beyond but then as the day falls and the light changes and the light in the room reflects you, yourself back from them and so the window becomes a mirror and I, I always find that in the artistic process is there's a point in every show I've done where I stop looking out at it and it starts reflecting back at me um, and and I think that's a really helpful thing to pursue and explore and, and I suppose why I thought it, it might be worth talking about today is that um, again just coming back to the pandemic and everybody having to live remotely you know for better or worse you know, like, you know, maybe 9-11 did for the generation before, this event that you, we are going through will define your generation as students. And um, there's no escaping that, but 
you know, how you choose to use that experience negatively or positively will be profound. And if you can find the self-learning and the self-understanding and the deeper inquiry that you, you find, even in the glumness and, and the isolation of the misery, um, you know, that, that will be unique. And, you, and, and your cohort, you know, when you're in your dotage, will always have that as artists and politicians and leaders and advocates and whatever you do. And, and it's probably hard to hold on to that now when you're not able to get out of the pub together, but, um, but it probably is worth holding on to. So that's my piece on acting. <laughs> Wow, th thank you so much, Rupert. That was that was so it's, it's really engaging, and even you managed to make a pepper and a chair and a table <laughs> sound sound genuinely like really interesting and just yeah. I mean, I I was actually I, so I'm also an English student, and I'm kind of I, I like to think that I'm sort of self aware and that I don't want to ever be too too pretentious in some ways. I don't know if there are associations of that. I, just just coming off the back of this really interesting way of trying to look for meaning, but not just kind of the essence of something but rather something that reflects yourself um do you think that when we start kind of analyzing the world kind of creating almost narratives of oh we're in a pandemic so then this is going to happen these kind of yeah this grand schematizing nature of how how we kind of interpret the world would you say that's 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 something that's a good thing or is that actually kind of does that create kind of a sense of denial or, or that that kind of other nuances to that um yeah good question i oh, it's so old. i'm so awful being old because of course everything you say sounds patronizing but but i do that but, but but actually i don't mean it as in like oh now i know i actually look back at my student self and and envy it because i i think at that age i guess you are more um optimistic about being part of grand narrative in some way or even shaping grand narrative and so you should be because you will um and 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 be that if that's an epidemic then then so be it I, I, you know for my generation it was probably you know interestingly in relation to this one it was the end of 12 years of a single government's rule i guess and it was pre-new labor but it was looking post poll tax riots and um you know we felt we were the birth of something new around whatever it was rave culture blah 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 and 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 that was really important to hold on to so i so i think you know the the objective grand narrative may end up being personal but I, but I don't think one should deny it in oneself. Um, I'm just saying that um, the idea that um, where I am in my response to the artwork, or indeed any, anything I study, just uh, certainly in my days at Cambridge felt anathema. I mean, I could never write that in an essay. You know, who, who cares who you are? But, but, but yet it's kind of the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and actually then kind of, thinking about kind of ideas of performance and finding yourself, um, you know, just moving on a little bit from, well, taking on the subject of Judy, that film, mm. um, you know, it's your second um, feature film, and yet it's still so tied to the theater and kind of, mm. again, the cost of performance and all these ideas that you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, is there, you know, how did you make that that move? I mean, you've done, you have so many um, productions in your in your kind of long catalogue of projects, but you know, yeah, how did you m maneuver that that move? And what are the sort of distinctions between directing for film and theatre? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously at the moment there's so much discussion about um, privilege in different kinds of forms, and and there, there's no denying that I. I had huge privilege when I came, you know, it was in my background. I'm mean, not that it was particularly more than middle class, but that was more than enough. Uh, and I, I recognised that. And I probably knew that even as a student. The only thing I was, I lacked, I guess, and I suppose everyone has their own sort of privations, is weirdly my parents, who were quite kind of bookish, um, had this odd sort of suspicion of cameras. They were kind of like, like I, don't, I don't think there's really many photos of me under the age of 12. It was sort of like somehow, I don't know, I don't know what they thought they were, like sort of vulgar in some way as opposed to a novel. Um, so certainly by the time I came to Cambridge, I, the idea of a camera really intimidated me. And I think then once I started directing, even though I was, you know, like lots of people really influenced by film and, and film as a form, I just felt a bit intimidated about the grammar. Actually, it is a grammar. Uh, at, at, um, and it's such a different way of thinking to theatre, directing on camera. Um, and then somebody gave me a book, called, a very good book, I don't know if it's still in print, called My First Movie, if anyone's interested in becoming a filmmaker. And it's, it's, an inter it's a set of interviews 
with um, filmmakers about their first film, the experience of making their first film. And what's really interesting is they come from very different backgrounds. Some come from theatre, but some are editors, some are actors, some are critics. Um, and of course, all their experiences are very different and they all feel totally fake when they do it because they've only brought their skill set. You know, and even yesterday I had a really um, experienced, high profile visual artist who's making their first feature contact me about directing actors, you know, because for them, that's the thing they're anxious about in the way that for me, it would, at the start, it was about lenses or whatever it might be. Um, but, but in this book, there's an Ang Lee interview where he says, oh, I've, I've got friends I was at film school with who, who are in their 40s who still think they're going to make their first movie. And I remember thinking, God, I'm like mid-30s. I've got five years left before it's, it's, it's a pipe dream. Um, so I just kind of really committed to trying to make it happen, thinking, how on earth does anyone make a film? That seems impossible. And like many things in life, actually, you know, it's what Stanislavski calls the will to fail. You know, so often the thing that's stopping you is a, 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 in you, a, a belief that you're going to fail. And so why try it? Um, I see it so often in auditions with actors, you know, they kind of, you know, they work really hard, but they want to fail. Um, I've, yeah, I remember students, you know, I remember um, students who'd work incredibly hard and they get to their finals and then, you know, stay up all night revising and drinking loads of coffee and be exhausted for the exam. And you think, you didn't want to succeed. You didn't want to put yourself in the point of place of test. You were too scared at some level. Um, and, um, you know, so I had that, I think about making a film. There was always a reason not to try. Um, and I kind of got lucky. I mean, I think my, my real luck was I made, a, um, I did a production of Macbeth that went on for years. It felt like it ended up on Broadway. And um, we were offered a kind of, uh, page to stage kind of a, a, a capture on stage on, on camera and I just felt I'd had a little window there I thought there's nearly enough money to try and make a sort of on location film here and we scraped a bit more money together and uh, it was with Patrick Stewart and um, I mean the crazy thing is we made that for like zero money in 12 days and it's still like um, like taught in schools my son just did it in his GCSEs um, uh, so you know, I, I guess I had something and I had a, and it had a star in on stage and I was able to pivot off that. And, and then that, that small scratchy film was enough to get me a way in. Um, and then also I think, you know, um, if I'm honest, America is a bit more of a sort of, you know, it's such a complicated country and I've spent so much of my working life there or doing American work. But um, in, in, in England, I suppose I found there's a lot of people paid not to make films. You know, a lot of, a lot of, film companies and the execs go, if I, if I green light this film and it doesn't succeed, I'll lose my job. Whereas, in, whereas America still has enough of an industry that it has to make movies. And if you go over there and you, you can be articulate and persuade people that you can sort their script out or persuade their actors to do it, then, then you've got a chance. Yes, thank you very much for that. And so, yeah, nice to bring in your, your wide ranging transatlantic experiences as well. <laughs> Um, you mentioned Macbeth, and I wanted to actually talk about your approaches to Shakespeare. I mean, I'm also, um, we did Merchant of Venice, I think, for kind of our GCSE, and we, we learned about Rupert Gould's um, production of the Almeida, a Merchant of Venice set in Las Vegas, and kind of, you know, you'd set the Tempest in the Arctic, these kind of crazy comparisons that you're able to make with your adaptations. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, how do you do that? <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. I kind of... Um... What I, I guess the kind of methodology took me a few shows to work out. Um, but I, I suppose I, I try and find a sort of um, a cultural context that I think the play might resonate in that the actors will find legible. Because you, if you do classical plays, you have to make sense of what crowns or daggers or whatever they are. And, you, and, and, it, and if you just do it purely abstractly, you often that doesn't liberate the actor very much. Um, and, and I guess my choice sometimes of those things is very much based again on that slightly new story. What I'll do is I'll kind of go, try and work out exactly what I think the play meant in its period. So with Macbeth, you know, I suppose I was very influenced by um, yeah, what I'd read about Cecil and the rise of the secret police in the aftermath of the gunpowder plot and Catholic, Catholic recusancy. And it kind of reminded me of... Um, I guess, sort of the Cold War and Le Carre. And uh, so that sort of felt kind of interesting mapping, as it were, very superficially. And so I always have that sort of social production. And then I'll put on it a, what I call a kind of formal production, which will 
be much more abstractly referenced and that Macbeth, I think, was sort of Japanese horror movies. Actually, was the was the formal reference. Um, but but I guess the choice of the formal reference is about trying to get to the. What, what I tend to find with classical work is it's really easy to lose sight of the most simple thing. And so with any play, I'll go like, what is the most simple important thing? Like, and with Macbeth, I felt like it's got to be scary. Romeo and Juliet, you've got to be moved. You know, uh, Tempest, it's got to feel magical. What, whatever they might be, like a really basic sort of, you know sub GCSE kind of post-it note and I'll always try and make sure don't lose sight of that because so many brushes I see do loads of great things but, but miss that basic the basic thrust so it's normally about those two things but, but actually I look back on things like that Tempest which I in some ways was the um, which was sort of set in the Arctic loosely and I'll, I'll I could explain for many reasons why we did that uh, Arctic being sort of Beckett it was um, I think now if I did that production it would be perceived as cultural appropriation and probably not unfairly as well I guess because you know it was drawing on a couple of Inuit movies I'd seen and and, and I think that's a it's a, I think our art form is an interesting moment now about how particularly in classical work is you know to what extent um the artist is um Permitted sounds too judgmental because I don't mean it judgmentally. I think it's important, sort of allowed uh, or has earned the right, I guess, to kind of use performance idioms that may not be theirs to play with. And I know this is a big thing and it's a big part of the wider so-called cultural wars discussion, but I think it sets um, sort of challenges, I guess, probably for the approach I used to take on Shakespeare, probably why I haven't done a Shakespeare for a while. Um, but I think... Um, you know, I, I can't really quite get to the bottom of all those arguments, but I think there's, it's something really interesting is going on in that discussion at the moment. So, um, so that old way of working, I might do, I might change going forward. Mm. So that, that's that's really interesting context for for these um, really really creative um, comparisons that you make. And on the topic of comparisons, actually, um, I was going to bring in. You mentioned your days at Cambridge and kind of Trinity and your historicism. I'm actually from Jesus, and we actually. Well, Eric Griffiths, I think you mentioned in the previous talk, but we, we actually really like him. So um, there's, there's a trade-off going on, uh, but, but to the point. Um, so, you know, the tragedy paper is a big part of the English tripos. Um, we've learned that it was started in 1919 and it kind of follows the, the political or the cultural conditions of the time. I've just, a long, long question short, kind of, would you say this paper, which, which kind of encourages you to make really quite broad comparisons between classical tragedy and Shakespearean tragedy and all other art forms. Did you see that coming into play in any of the productions that you created later on in your career or anything that you learned from that paper were you able to take away from? Yeah, I always had, had an ambivalent relationship to the tragedy paper. I, I thought it was sort of a bit bogus when I was there, feeling it was sort of like, yeah, a bit, uh, people showing off at some level uh, and, and not really meaningful. I mean, funny, actually, we did it at the Armada, we did a whole season of Greek tragedies and a lot of uh, ancillary work and we were around tragedies format and I run a lot of workshops on it. And I think maybe my, I probably was a bit disrespectful at Cambridge and, and, and understand it better now. I do remember Eric himself actually gave a lecture. Eric Griffiths, for those who don't know, was an incredibly controversial Don at Trinity when I was there who got into lots of trouble and died recently, but was at his best the most it's incredible teacher. Um, behaved very inappropriately in lots of ways, but but at, at his best was was mesmerising. And he had a lecture in the tragedy paper called "Understanding Monsters," which was about Iago, um, Medea, Myra Hindley. Um, you know, one of those typical tragedy kind of oh, it's about everything kind of thing. <laughs> Um, and I remember, you know, in the middle of the lecture, he'd say, and now I come to my title, Understanding Monsters. Uh, uh, he'd say, you know, it's, this is not about understanding monsters. This is about the act of understanding monsters oneself. And to try and understand evil, very Catholic again, that pure evil should not be understood. It, 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 it turns one into a monster if you try to understand psychopathology. Weirdly, that was the dominant idea behind the first movie I made called True Story. And I remember talking to Jonah Hill and James Franco about it and saying, the thesis of my film is based on Eric Griffith's uh, lecture in the tragedy paper. So, so in that sense, it did, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, even someone that you thought you might have just different ideas to you actually created something, yeah. Um, actually, we've got a few audience questions now. Um, 
So someone's saying, I've directed at Cambridge. Where do I go from there? Is it better to start doing our own projects with limited means or to try and learn the craft by having a tiny, tiny junior job in a huge production in which we might be lost? Yeah. Um, look, I think the, I always say that directing is like a, um, a three-tiered pyramid. It's like a huge base, huge base. So many people not earning a living but all calling themselves directors. And then it narrows really sharply to a small group of people who are kind of making a living um, and working reasonably regularly. And then it narrows again very sharply to a very small group of people who are really in demand. And by far the hardest bit is going from the first to the second. Um, and um, how do you get going? Well, look, I think um, there are, certainly compared to when I started out, there are many more um, things like the RTYDS placements um, uh, that I think Channel 4 sport or the used to sport. Um, there, there are just more placements at different theatres. We run some of the Almeida that can get you in. And I, I certainly think, you know, you, you need a mentor. You really need a mentor. Um, I had one. Most people I know had somebody who was looking out for them at some level. You're just listening to them, helping them with the work, and then maybe saying, oh, you should see this person. This person might be worth working with and how you find that mentor is like pestering and writing thousands of letters or emails now and, and you know hoping it'll land um but equally i don't think you want to assist too long i think i think maybe 18 months to two years is a good length to assist um or, or there could be a finite number of projects i mean i say you don't want to assist it so you have to to make a living so but i got to the point going i think it's killing me a bit to assisting i assist some sam Mendes and some you know, good people um and i stopped and just said, I'm going to try and pay my rent by teaching at drama schools, which I did for three or four years and, um, you know, rather than assist, uh, because I felt just me leading the room, even if the room was just, um, you know, some first year drama students was still more productive for my learning than sitting at somebody else's elbow. I'm not saying that works for everybody, but I remember Sam saying to me, the reason he thought I was going to be a great director because he asked, he asked me to direct um, Richard II on film. Uh, and he said, oh, you, the reason he thought I was a proper director was because I was such a bad assistant. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think there is some, some truth in that. The thing about being an assistant is you have to absolutely pretend you have complete humility and um, civility. Uh, but, you know, most directors are megalomaniacs. <laughs> it was an awful thing to say. And, and, and I think you, I mean, they shouldn't be, but unfortunately they are controlling. You know, I think if you, if you like to control things, then you're probably not great, you know, to have a party, but you probably might be a director. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny calling in that way. And it's probably not a great... A <laughs> great mirror, but I, the other, well, although I always think that directors fall into two types. There are what I call um, people who are trying to look for a surrogate family in the rehearsal room, and they are normally dealing with stuff in their own childhoods about their own issues with their parents or their siblings or whatever, and they want to, or politics, and they want to recreate or create a different kind of society in the rehearsal room, a more democratic or a more whatever, lots of different, it can be suspect or idealistic, but for them, it's not really about the work so much, it's about the process in the room. And then there are others who are what I call world creators who like basically are opening their box of toy, you know, toys and dolls and, you know, creating a, another world. Um, and, you know, you get good and bad examples of both, both good artistically, but good morally. Um, but, but they tend to fall into one or the other. And um, so I think, I mean, I, I'm more of the, the latter. And I think so I was probably less interested in spending loads of time watching other people's rooms because I wanted to, have my own room. I, I, I like this comparison, even if you admit maybe directors can be, um, this, this all adds to the fun. Um, yeah. I have another question actually on from the audience, from Ida Lalu on, on acting this time. Mm. Um, what would you recommend to an actor if the way they express their emotion is very personal and truthful, but not paradigmatic? Um, and they, or they don't, or they don't kind of act in the way that a normal audience would expect them to. Um, but it is truthful. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I saw somebody um, talking about Nicolas Cage the other day um, and saying that 
you know, it's basically the history of acting has been people have come along and reinvented it, you know, whether it's Burbage or Garrick or Olivier, and, and then that's become dated. And this, this article was saying that the last person you could really say that about was Marlon Brando, who kind of, you know, that period that was like, oh my God, this is a whole new thing. And pretty much since then, everybody's kind of acted like Brando. Except, and the, but, but maybe Nicolas Cage has reinvented acting, this sort of crazy, you know, Werner Herzog-like kind of huge um, ultra express, sorry, expressionism on film in a way. Is it truthful? Uh, like, not in a way that I recognise, but, but is it authentic? Absolutely. Um, and I think, um, you know, if you're an actor and you're different, like genuinely different, that's a great thing. That's a really great thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you for that. Um, we have some more questions on kind of live stream this time and online performance. We've kind of moved from directing, acting, and now kind of the audience, I suppose. Um, do you fear that live stream slash online performance events or straight to Netflix and TV releases could reduce the perceived value of film and theater in a similar way that streaming has done for music? My God, that's such a pertinent question because I've been dealing with that all day. Um, um, no, I think ultimately it's great about access. We, we did a sh um, production last week at my theatre called Him. Um, that was, um, we didn't know whether to do it. It was funny, we programmed it for, for an audience and then we were like, okay, it's gonna be a socially distanced audience. And then we got to first week of January and we really had a moment ago going like, are we gonna look incredibly irresponsible calling these actors into the room given the mutation is really going off? The actors really wanted to do it. Um, you know, we were testing them twice a week. Anyway, we did it in the end and we shot it and we filmed it. And uh, the response was amazing. And we had a really great uptake to it. And um, I don't think that if we brought it back on stage, which I very much hope we will, that, I think it will, there'll be more people wanting to come and see it. And in fact, like the evidence, I think in Les Mis, when that film came out, the box office absolutely went wild at the theatre. So I don't think screen capture has to. But I think the biggest argument is, you know, we looked at our, the Almeida's um, uh, numbers and, and I think 60% of our audience were outside London, which, you know, we would just never get in the Almeida and it was national and international. And I think access is a massive thing. And I think particularly with regional theatres getting a bit of, you know, struggling more and more in terms of local authority funding you know, seeing great art more widely is a good thing. I think where it is really tricky, a bit like music, and it's a good analogy, is like, what is the appropriate remuneration for the artists? Like, how do you, you know, if it's going to do really, really well, they deserve to earn off that. And they don't, you don't want a Spotify situation where it's almost like a hobby to make music now, isn't it? I mean, especially now, you can't perform live. So I think there's a lot of work for the unions to do to try and crack that. But, um, but ultimately, I think there are possibilities. That's great. And actually on the topic of possibilities, someone else is asking, has the pandemic brought out any new innovations in the world of theatre and film? Yeah, actually, I had a, again, yesterday, I had, we worked with a Belgian company called, I'm going to mispronounce them, but it's like Entre de Gourde. They're a very really extraordinary sort of interactive company. And so I had a first early trial of a piece they're doing, a Zoom piece, basically, where um, I, won't, I won't give it away what happens, but it's, uh, you sort of buy your ticket and you sign up and it's international. So the audience are being drawn from all over the world and you enter into a uh, surprising, shocking, at some time, really arrestingly intimate kind of experience in a sort of, and their work is often sort of single performer to single audience member. Um, and I, it's the first thing I sort of thought, oh, this is really looking at the technology in an interesting way about, um, in, in the form of, of how things can be presented. Um, I will say though, I think it's surprising that maybe more hasn't come out. And I think the truth of that is that people have been in shock. I mean, like, like just to try and work out, I think if we all had known it was going to be a year, 18 months or whatever, then we would have all started a bit like, for me as an artistic director, I've been basically working in like two or three month cycles going, okay, we'll just move and we'll move and we'll move and we'll move. And, and uh, you know, when you're doing that, you're sort of so constantly firefighting, it's very hard to stop and go, okay, in a year's time, what might it look like? Um, but, but I'm sure great stuff is happening, yeah. And actually, um, when you mentioned artistic director, um, mm. I'm going to pull up that quotation that you, you made um, in 2017 with the Evening Standard, um, when you said, being a director is a remote job, actors hang out in the pub together, writers have a real community, 
directors are lone wolves and there is no lonelier wolf than the artistic director. Now I feel like that's really prescient to our times. Firstly, the pub's shut, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but you know, w w what is it about kind of the artistic director? If you could maybe perhaps elaborate on that role in case people aren't so familiar with that. And also has it been made kind of more more lonely because of the pandemic or how have you found that no, I mean, I, uh, the truth is the opposite actually i think that um, particularly in london you know, we sit there in our different theaters and kind of we're kind of unspokenly kind of in competition with each other we're, we're literally in competition with for each other with audiences but we're in, you know we're all trying to get to the top of the pole be the acclaimed you know it's a crazy mad it's it's very like cambridge drama actually <laughs> if i'm honest it's exactly bitchy and gossipy and competitive and unpleasant and uh, <laughs> aspirational um what happened in the pandemic though was that so i have a weekly call with all the london theater artistic directors zoom and it's, it's been great it's been really funny and and kind of emotional and supportive and critical and um, so for, for the first time ever, I think, and, and actually I've, I've had them with, you know, European theatres and um, there has been a great, it's the best thing that's come out of the year actually has been the sense of the sector working collectively to try and rescue itself and the freelance community as best it can. So it's been, for artistic directors, although it's been punishing, it's also been not lonely, I'd say. Um, normally though, I think, um, I mean, I became an artistic director because I couldn't, no one would allow me to direct the work that I wanted to direct. I would pitch it and I would be given either something else or not invited in. And I thought, you know, I can't, it's like talking about music. Ultimately you have to play it. You can't talk about it. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna go and try and become an artistic director somewhere and hope that the stuff that I see in my head turns out to be as good as I think it is. And I never, I never got into it. I mean, this sounds very, false but I didn't get into it for the power or the kind of being a gatekeeper or whatever mm. um but of course having done it now for 20 years practically um it, there is an enormous amount of power particularly as opportunities diminish and there is a huge amount of responsibility to you know towards the the twin totems of um excellence and inclusivity you know you, you want the work to be as good as possible and as inspiring as possible and you want the the it to reflect as inclusive of a representation of society as you can and, and um, you know really simply if you're an artistic director a bit like running the ADC I imagine um, you know you have you know say I might have three shows for each slot so I know that's two creative teams I'm probably going to have to disappoint and so you're constantly letting people down and it's amazing how often the people you don't let down oddly or ungrateful <laughs> and demand more money and you know <laughs> wish that they had more rehearsal time um so you know the the gift is of course the wonderful ability to work with a community of artists and to really curate them and to have those ongoing dialogues and to produce their work and it really rewards your own work to be working with other artists but um i think it's got harder definitely it's got harder and the responsibilities have got greater and you have to kind of I'm not sure if I knew what it was now, whether I would have got into it in the same way, because I'm not sure it suits my personality. I think you have to have a slightly more, um, you, you have to be an advocate and a politician. I mean, in, in the good way, not in the critical way. Um, you have to like that um, uh, now. And, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah. And you mentioned kind of topics of community, competition, all these kind of, yeah, fluctuating together. Um, I just wanted to ask kind of, the Almeida is known for really, you know, quite big, bold, provocative performances, asking the big questions of the day. And then mm. I was just intrigued by, you know, um, different theatres have been adapting to the pandemic, the pandemic in different ways in terms of performance. So you mentioned kind of the Zoom thing that you can do, um, I think, or, or maybe they refer to the back catalogue. And then, and it's quite interest, interest me that you've gone for kind of this almost middle ground, quite sensible um, way of doing a socially distanced performance of him mm. that happened kind of last week and then it's going to be put on on demand in the next week so it, it kind of feels slightly analog in some ways and I was just wondering how you came to this well yeah how, how you came to this decision on how to balance the different experimentational modes of theatre I mean it's a bit suck it and see if I'm honest you kind of uh, you hope it's going to work but um, I guess I guess maybe you know, I'm lucky, I suppose, in that I've done quite a bit of screen work now. So I kind of maybe um, I'm more comfortable with the possibilities of what screen capture means around drama. And um, I used to have this really ridiculous, reductive 
homily, which I'll spew out again, which was which, which what I sort of believe in, which is that I think theatre is at, at heart a medium of argument. Um, I think its function above all is to create a room full of people who wanted to share and discuss and have a collective experience and go out together. And, you know, I think the work particularly at Headlong was very much geared around those sorts of ideas, uh, a sort of dialectic, I guess, at work. Um, I think TV now is the medium of narrative. It's taken over what the 19th century you had in the novel. And I think it's driven above all by narrative and how narrative um, you know, creates uh, atmospheres and, 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 and readings, as it were. And I think film is a, is a medium of character. I think there's just something about the close-up and uh, getting close to the... Now, of course, there are great characters and plays and TV kind of, uh, as well, but, but innately I feel that kind of waiting. And I think it is about the proximity of the lens to the, to the face often, actually. And so one of the things with him is we, you know, I think we were the first one to do it with Steadicam and kind of really get cameras very, very close to the performers. And I think that kind of maybe made a difference. So, so we're kind of, I guess, each, like, and in fact, the next thing we're doing is probably more based on audio, actually, audio capture and, and the possibilities around that. And, and, you know, trying to lean into, you know, everyone's pounding the streets these days, aren't they? Listen to podcasts and kind of like, what, 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 what space can we occupy there for, for you know, as theatre makers? So, you know, we just sort of, you know, you find your way, I guess. Yeah. Um, and someone's submitted another question. Um, which of your productions are you most proud of? And do you have a dream venue you'd like to work or perform in? Oh, gosh. Um talking about your children isn't it i i think um so the i used to do this exercise where i try and think on the press night or the first performance who i imagine sitting next to me watching the work and you know whether it's my mum or my wife or the critic at the guardian or like uh a director I really admired to try and get a sense of like who I felt I was creating it for. And I always aspired to create a piece just for myself, that if I was the only person in the room, that I would still love it as much. Um, and the two pieces, I think I, I did a adaptation of a Pirandello play called Six Characters and Such an Author um, back in 2009, 10, I think, which, which I think was uh, just in that kind of narcissism where I kind of I never didn't find light in it. And then oddly, a, a musical I did actually about seven years ago on based on American Psycho, the Brett Easton Ellis novel. Um, and I think that was, you know, it was in no ways a perfect piece. Uh, and in fact, it was a famous flop on Broadway, actually, <laughs> although I, I was really proud of that production. But I think it was, um, when I come back to that, the sort of pepper thing, like trying to find out who, who I am as an artist, for whatever reason, I, I could speculate for hours, but I think that... I think my inquiry in drama is around loneliness, I think. And I think that I, I maybe believe that all stories are about loneliness at some level, the man, you know, the, to be on one's own and to be in public. And I think maybe all the, if I was to reduce this into a single line, everything I've ever directed, I think that's probably what I'm sort of most returned to. And I think that musical captured some of that. Uh, and venue, um, I really love the Bristol Old Vic. It's the most beautiful. I have worked there before, though, so that doesn't count, maybe. Um, um, I kind of love the Royal Opera House. I mean, I've never directed there, but I mean, I'd love to sort of do something very antagonistic to that space. I mean, you already have over, I've, I counted on your Wikipedia, actually, you have already over 50 um, performances. I'm sure you can, I'm sure you can do many, many more. We're very excited about that. Um, we also have a question on how can audiences support theatres at this time? Um. I mean, you know, those that have can give, and, and you know, <laughs> and people have been great that way. They really have. I mean, actually, this, like I said, the show we did last week, you know, we made probably nearly half as much again on donations from ticket sales. Um, I have a feeling that when, I was, when not if, but we all come back and, and you know, clearly theatre and society will be different. But I just sense such a pent up demand to see live performance at the moment. Uh, you know, not just theatre, music, everything. I think people are desperate for it. Um, so, you know, what I'd say to maybe people, that, you know, assuming I'm now currently talking to students here is, is, is keep creating, you know, you're the next generation. And I think the 
I, I, maybe it's improved since I was at Cambridge, but the one area in particular, I think, is like writers. You know, that are, you know we are a literary art form, ultimately, I think, uh, certainly in this country. And, you know, we may not always want to be, and we're less maybe than we are in the States are, but, you know, we always need great stories. And so if you've got any part of you that is creative or wants to tell a story, um, particularly in dramatic format, you know, commit to that. Um, and then I suppose it's also... It's a really small thing, but just if you see performers or that you know, or artists that you know, whatever stage in the career they are, tell them how much you think it's great what they do. Because I think a lot, there's a lot of people going through a lot of self-doubt, really, about whether the sector will return, but also why they're doing it. And um, I think they really, you know, I can't bear social media, I can't bear Twitter, but I suppose one of its good things is that it can spread love as well as hate. <laughs> and that's really great to hear. Yes, and that's... And Thank you for that. And I, I think we have another um, audience question that's a bit a bit specific, actually, um, but on the topic of giving advice to kind of the next generation. Do you have any advice for an actor who wants to work with the RSC? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think people would always be surprised. I say this now, and Hannah Miller, who's the casting director of the RSC, will kill me probably, but that... that um, they just want to be in touch, you know, like if you're a playwright, you know, write into the, find out if theatre's got a literary department. And if so, if you're an actor, now we don't have a casting department at the Almeida because our staff is too small, but the, the National and the RSC do. And so write and, and write again. And I, what I always say to anybody who's, who, who wants to be seen, whether they're a writer or a director or whatever is, you know, email once or twice. And then if someone's said, oh yeah, we'll try and see something you know, in the few days leading up to the point they said they might come, just badger them, just keep saying, are you still on for Wednesday? Great, I've put a ticket aside for you, you know, just really try and, because that drip drip effect often is really, really effective. And I suppose the RSC in particular, I think, um, you know, I know a lot of people at Cambridge think like, who are actors think like, should I go to drama school? And that's like a huge decision, a big financial outlay, it's three more years, it's kind of crazy. I think if you really want to work at the RSC, um, then some kind of um, training that has some classical element in performance, not in academia, is, is a useful thing. It's not essential. And there are loads of varsity actors who've just kind of gone, but um, it, it develops the muscle, I suppose. It, it, acting is a, a physical thing, and that's not really strong at Cambridge, or certainly my memory of it. Um, but write, yeah, write in, write in, write a passionate letter, say how much you love Shakespeare, how, how much you love the company, what it is specifically you love, and uh, and write to the cast and drama, don't write to the artistic director. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that as well. Um, I, we only have two minutes left, and I just have, I guess, one final question, mm. um, just to kind of try and wrap things up. I mean, you've started with your journey in Cambridge, mm. and then moving into, you know, position of directing for the theatre, film, now as artistic director, and now kind of, Rec not recruiting, but kind of forging the next generation of, of, of writers. Um, have you, you know, we talk, okay, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome. Um, have you ever felt that? Have you overcome it? How can you overcome it? Those sorts of questions, I think I will close. Oh, I, massively. I mean, I cannot, I mean, I felt it hugely at Cambridge. You know, I didn't do anything like that for my first two years. I mean, I was, you know, certainly when I arrived at Cambridge, I was kind of, innately shy I think anyway uh, but I felt it massively professionally as well and you know I, I still do you know particularly you go on a film set you know loads of people staring at you it's like terrifying uh first time I directed an opera you know the um first time I directed anything professional you know it's, it, there, there are always moments of, of 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 deep doubt um I can't I mean, actually, again, in my stupid metrics, I, I used to think there was a, that, that directors were like a quadrant, you know, and on one axis was um, confidence and doubt, um, right. and the other was um, flair or inability. And um, so obviously, if you've got flair and have confidence, you know, like Sam Mendes or whatever, then, then you're probably going to do pretty well. Uh, and if you have neither, then you probably shouldn't be a director. Um, <laughs> But I think there are interesting examples of people who are very confident and don't have flair, but are still very effective. And, and I, myself, I would locate myself, I do think I have some flair, but I often have crippling doubt. And um, what I'm always interested in, in, in the really doubting artists, is how, if they have humility and um, kindness in them, yeah. manifesting their doubt can often be the thing that is really empowering to the process. So 
a director like Simon McBurney, who, who runs Complicity, who's, who's arguably the best director in the country. My sense of him is that he goes into the room and will often go, I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm really struggling. And his actors rally together, knowing there is a vision mm. that they will make together. And he doesn't want to lead or dominate. He, 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 it's almost like, a, like he's bleeding out in front of them in a way. And, 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 and that, that's a really valid way to be. I mean, I think people, people smell, you know, that, that's the thing about you go into a room as a director, you need to inspire trust, mm. not confidence, trust. And if you can't do that through confidence, you've got to do it through listening and compassion. Um, but, um, but they'll smell bullshit off you otherwise. <laughs> so much better to be honest about it than, than, than puff your chest up. Because I've seen that so, even now I see so many directors like that. Right. You know. I tell you what's really gratifying is if you look at on-set photos of famous movies. Like I think I saw one of Scorsese directing is it Brando? Uh, no, it's someone famous anyway. I mean, it was Coppola directing Brando and the Godfather. And you always see the same thing, is these directors looking incredibly nervous around stars. And you go like, okay, if they felt that, then it's fine for me to feel that. <laughs> yeah, the Godfather or, or whatever it was. Yeah. High bar. No, well, what a, what a way to end. Um, thank you so much, Rupert, for your time. Thank you Not to problem. everyone for the audience questions as well. Um, yeah. If you enjoyed it. And honestly, um, it was just a really engaging conversation and although it was online and I'm sitting in my room and you're I really like your background um, <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah I, I hope I hope you enjoyed it I hope I hope our members and non-members of the Cambridge Union also enjoyed it and thank you very much have a lovely evening yeah great good luck to you all thank you